You know, tonight something happened at Bridgestone Arena that I never thought that I would see. Tonight, during the third period, out of frustration, a Nashville Predators fan took a catfish and threw it onto the ice during play. Now, in case you didn't hear me earlier, that is never acceptable, no matter how frustrated you get, and it should never have happened. But seeing that catfish thrown on the ice during game play, causing a stoppage, causing potentially problems for the team moving forward with what has been one of the most beloved traditions in franchise history, it made me start thinking, well, I didn't have much else to think about during the third period as the Nashville Predators were not performing up to standard on their own home rink, and I was listening to Let's Go Bruins chants throughout the entire third period. So it gave me time to think about this catfish that suddenly was thrown onto the ice, and it was, in fact, a catfish too far. And the Preds have reached an excess point tonight, and... One fan just took the beloved tradition of throwing a catfish on the ice and he turned it into a moment of protest through frustration. Now, again, that can never happen, should never happen, and I hope it never happens again. But this particular person thought in his frustration that it was time to just throw his catfish over the glass and exit the arena, probably heading off to get arrested. Taking that catfish and throwing it on the ice in frustration was a true sign of protest by this one fan. And the franchise, it has hit a turning point. The fun is gone. And in tonight's 5 nothing loss versus the Boston Bruins, the Band-Aid was fully ripped off. Section 303, largely filled with Boston Bruins fans, the visiting team from the Eastern Conference had enough fans to take over what has been, since day one, the stronghold section for Nashville Predators fanatics. I can only imagine those survivors of Section 303 that have been there, Mark Hollingsworth, Derek Hines, and so many others, I can only imagine what they felt tonight sitting there in Section 303 as they had to hear, let's go Bruins, rain down over them, overpowering them just too much. Combine that with the numerous empty seats in the building that we've seen not only tonight against the Boston Bruins, but in numerous home games as of late. This has to be a wake-up call to everybody over at 501 Broadway. Everyone from the top down needs to understand that tonight was a turning point for this franchise, and for this fan base. The team core, they once captured the imagination of every sports fan in Nashville. 60,000 people downtown to watch that core group take on the Pittsburgh Penguins in the Stanley Cup final. That was quite a bit of time ago. And now, that core is long broken. Even with career years and record seasons last year, the Nashville Predators were barely able to squeak into the playoffs. And we all remember what happened when they did barely squeak into the playoffs. They were absolutely routed by last year's class team in the NHL, the Colorado Avalanche, in the only sweep in Nashville Predators franchise history. It was a measuring stick moment for the Nashville Predators that the Nashville Predators failed to measure up to. Coming into this season, there was a lot of good talk. There was a lot that was going to happen. There were some additions made to the team. The competitive rebuild, as has been sold since 2019, continued on. The team core now is broken. The team core is ready to be broken up. But that leads us to some really important questions. Who is going to be broken up from the team core? Is this going to be a complete removal of all of the familiar names and all of the big contracts that the Nashville Predators have pieced together over the last generation of this franchise? How will they go about doing it? 
Will they clean house going into the trade deadline coming up here soon? We've already heard the rumors being floated to radio hosts and some other NHL insiders that the Nashville Predators are not only going to be sellers if they continue this trend, but that David Poyle will pick up the phone and have a conversation about anyone. What does that actually mean? So who, how, most importantly, Will David Poyle be the one rebuilding this? With the next decade plus of this Nashville Predators franchise up in the air and no clear mission statement and no clear direction, is David Poyle the right general manager at this time to break apart this core and send these assets across the landscape of the NHL in return for what? What is the plan for prospects, for draft picks, for the next general manager, for current rostered players that could come in and reshape this Nashville Predators team somehow between the next 30 games and next season? Is David Poyle the right general manager with all of his credentials, being a Hall of Famer, being the winningest general manager in NHL history, with all of those credentials, Is it time for him to be deciding what will happen with this Nashville Predators franchise for the next decade? It's not just David Poyle. It's not just the general manager. It's not just the lack of clear vision and direction with the roster itself. It is the coaching staff. Coaches made decisions this season that have left the team flat and confounded. Closed-door meetings without the coaches... That's always something to pay attention to. Word salad. I've always appreciated the fact that John Hines is willing to give full, lengthy answers to how he thinks and why he makes decisions. But frankly, as of late, it's just become word salad. None of the things he is talking about are happening in application out there on the ice or with the players or with the team. Some of the most recent decisions, starting Lankinen versus Arizona and then sacrificing UC Soros to the Boston Bruins, two points could have been attained against the Arizona Coyotes with a Vezina caliber goaltender in net, even with a flat Nashville Predators team in that game. But against the Boston Bruins, UC Soros never had a chance. Not only did you sacrifice your starting goaltender, but you sacrificed his confidence going forward into the next series of games. Another measuring stick moment where the Nashville Predators failed to measure up. The coaching staff has been making difficult and troubling decisions all season long. I give you that example right there, but what about the inability to find any cohesion in the lines this season? The Nashville Predators had remained relatively healthy until Philip Forsberg But where was the cohesiveness in the units? Where were the combinations that had any chemistry? A failure for 50-plus games now. It's okay to be experimenting and moving pieces around, but ultimately you have to find some cohesion in the lineup. And when several of these players have been together for several years now and they cannot find any chemistry or cohesion, then I think we all know where this is leading to. The general manager, the coaching staff, the players, all of them share blame in this particular situation. And just what about the obsession with Cole Smith? The sacrifice of Ellie Tolvin in this season and what he is now accomplishing, exposing the Nashville Predators even further in these examples that I am giving right here. Numerous, numerous options could have been in this lineup this season over Cole Smith, the team, the front office, the coaching staff, they've all crossed the line tonight. And if the best you can do against the class of the NHL is a listless, passionless 60 minutes of hockey, then it's not time for a closed door meeting or leaking rumors to the media. It's time for real change. And that time is now. It's time to break up the core of this team the competitive rebuild era as ever. Tonight was simply a catfish too far. I'm your host and captain, Crazy Charlie Sonier. Stick taps, love, and respect. Mm-hmm.